all the great wisdom traditions tell us that death is an opportunity to reflect on life. There's something about moving towards death or leaning into death that actually reveals so much more about life, even to the perception that there's something deathless that underpins all of life. So all around the world at the moment, death is feeling a whole lot closer than it usually does. Many of the distractions that we use to keep us with a sense of staying in life feel like they're not working so well because of the coronavirus. And so I thought it's an opportunity to turn to one of the Western tradition's greatest meditations upon death and the invitation it offers to see something more profoundly about life and see whether it can indeed offer us something now. It's Plato's dialogue, The Phaedo. The Phaedo is an account of Socrates' last hours, and in fact it ends with Socrates' death itself. The scene is the prison where Socrates has been waiting to drink the hemlock, and surrounding him are his family and friends, and they are a mix of fearful and upset. Um, some of them cry, some of them can hardly bear to stay in the room, thinking that this most amazing person in their life um, is inevitably about to die. It's just hours away. Some are full of love and concern, and they perhaps want to do practical things to help Socrates, or they perhaps want to reach out and be with their friend in his last hours. So you've got that mix of both fear and compassion that proximity to death brings up, and again, which we're seeing now. Um, you go into the supermarket and see evidence of the fear, say, with the panic buying. Um, or you have discussions where you sense the shadow of fear as people try to work out what the best thing to do is. Or you see the anger that gets unleashed at times like this against governments or official bodies. Um, trying to overcome the uncertainty with the demand for more certainty. It's another manifestation of the fear. It happens. In the Phaedo, Plato recognises that, but invites us to watch for the moments where we can step back from the fear and see whether a different perception can come through. Similarly to with the love and concern that gets shown, you see that coming through now too, whether it be stories of neighbourhoods singing from their balconies, people offering small kindnesses, checking on relatives, um, that's all good and it goes on. But in fact, Plato is inviting us even to not put that to one side as in stop it, but put it to one side as in see whether there's more that we can perceive, maybe beyond and through it as well. Is the proximity of death an occasion to see not just even love and compassion, but something else about the nature of life itself? And so in the dialogue, Plato has Socrates guiding his friends, guiding his family through these obvious responses to the proximity of his death to see whether they can sense something else that's most basic, that's most grounded about life itself and which of course Socrates himself is trusting in, is resting on because he is the person who's about to die who is about to drink the hemlock. You know, there is nothing more tangibly certain in the whole of his life than that the sentence is about to be carried out. So what has he got that maybe is even more sure, more trustworthy than that? It sets up a real tension in the dialogue, um, a bit like the tension that we feel when death comes that little bit closer. And it's working with that tension 
um, staying with it, tolerating it, seeing whether it's energy that can feel so negative or troubling at times can actually flip around to become the energy that shows us something more permanent. Um, Socrates says that it's a bit like going into a labyrinth. Um, the reason why he's in fact in prison um, and hasn't been executed already, um, uh, he had to wait to drink the hemlock, is because ancient Athens of his day kept a festival where they sent a ship to the island of Delos, which was the cult home of Apollo. And it remembered the time when, in mythical history, Theseus had saved the Athenians from the Minotaur. Theseus, you remember in the myth, enters the, enters the labyrinth, finds the Minotaur and slays him and then finds his way out because he left a trail. And the implication is, is that if we can follow Socrates into this kind of labyrinthine encounter with the Minotaur, with death, then maybe we too can see something that we hadn't seen before and, as it were, slay death in this most profound way, slay the fear of death um, in a way that can become lasting in our life. And I like the image of the labyrinth too because the way that this works is not by coming up with one convincing argument that's going to trounce all other arguments, not even by one convincing perception that then is going to be reliable and stable and unfailing. That's just not what life is like. But what it's going to offer is a sense that if you can lower yourself down into your doubts, then at the bottom you can start to see perceptions that are increasingly subtle, but precisely because they're so subtle, they're therefore the most pervasive things around and about. Actually, it's about learning to pay attention more and more to the subtle things in life and finding that they're actually the most determining of life. This too is a perception that makes sense to me as a psychotherapist, because I think a lot of what therapy is about is learning to pay attention to those things that at first seem completely inconsequential. You know, the little hints and nudges that maybe something isn't going quite right. But if you can stay with them, you'll find that they develop into the narratives, the stories that profoundly shape your life, in fact, that were operative all through your life. So subtlety is a really important thing. Um, I like Wittgenstein's image here. He talked about how when we're going into that which is the deepest and it leads clear to us, we need to have that which is most sure and strong to lower ourselves down into what is at the moment less clear. He talked about it being like a well and the walls of the well that we have to kind of work our way down um, with. Um, so that's the way that this dialogue works and I think that is very true to psychology too that Plato and perhaps we begin with what we can sort of make stand up the best at the start, realise where it fails, realise where it doesn't actually provide all the, the confidence that we thought it might. But that is precisely the moment where a new horizon can open up, something that we hadn't seen before in that failure. Again, it's something about the energy of failure, um, the energy of fear, um, that when it doesn't overwhelm us, actually can lead us to something more deep and more profound. So to return to Plato's dialogue itself, um, it opens up with lines that give us a clue to where the argument's going to end up. Um, the opening lines of Plato dialogue, Plato's dialogues often do this. And in this case, the opening line is a friend of Phaedo asking Phaedo whether he himself was there when Socrates died. You yourself, Phaedo, is the opening words. And that gives us a clue because it's going to be discovering something that we know most intimately, intimately in ourselves that the dialogue is going to try and open up for us and that is actually going to be the path to the greatest sense that life exceeds death. It's in you yourself, as the friend of Fido says, you yourself, Fido, were you there? 
And then the friend says, you yourself, Fido, were you there when Socrates drank from the cup? And again, that sets up the tension, the necessary tension. It's going to be about some discovering something inside ourselves. But it's going to be about discovering what remains inside ourselves when other things fall away. When you might say the everyday distractions, the everyday hopes, the everyday efforts to put together an argument that persuades us that life exceeds death, as they fall away, as they die, um, like Socrates symbolically drinking from the cup. It's that tension which we're going to sort of ride and see what else is revealed inside ourselves. Now, the dialogue then, when it gets going, begins with something that um, is very immediate, is very everyday, is very humdrum. And it's the, the ups and downs of pleasure and pain. Um, this is actually done in a slightly humorous way in the dialogue because um, as Socrates is going to die, he's able to take his chains off um, and he takes his chains off, rubs his leg and says, oh, how amazing. You know, what was painful so quickly gives away to pleasure. Um, you know, it's now nice to have a leg again rather than unpleasant to have a leg because previously it had been in chains. But immediately Socrates says, but look, plain, pain always follows pleasure or pleasure always follows pain. That is an everyday cycle, facets of life. And he said, if I was going to write an Aesop-like fable, I would tell a story of pleasure and pain where they were linked together, where they were conjoined at the head, because one always follows another. In other words, when thinking about death and life, we've got to very quickly move beyond the trying to hold on to that which is pleasurable and get rid of that which is painful, because that's not going to take us anywhere. And what Socrates sees next is that we need to hear a deeper music. He says that he's been having dreams, and in, that, in those dreams he's been told to sing a more beautiful song. Um, it's a really wonderful sort of hint as, uh, as to how to go a bit deeper, um, to hear something, not with, um, as it were, the empirical senses, a bit like we feel pleasure and pain with our, our, our empirical bodies, um, but to listen to something that is a bit more internal, a bit, um, therefore, less subject to the ups and downs of the everyday. Can we hear that deeper music, he says? And then moreover, he says, look, we think we're philosophers, um, and by that they just mean the pursuers or lovers of wisdom, of the greatest truths in life. And yet, we need to be able to understand what we're talking about in the right way. Um, we can come up with arguments, we can come up with intimations and intuitions, but unless we hear them like this deeper music in the right way, they're not going to open up the deepest truths to us. So they begin to try and hear this inner music, find a way into this labyrinth, by considering, first of all, everyday life that which is most immediate and we're most consciously immersed in. It's a life that's to do with our bodies, but it's also the life that's to do with the inner vitality of our body. And that's incidentally what they meant by soul. It's that which animates us. So it's the qualities of hope and aspiration um, and fear and doubt. Um, that whole complex of what we would now call psychology as much as um, the physical presence that we have in the world. And they consider how various people try to find a kind of deathlessness or timelessness in their everyday lives. So, for example, some might become very ascetic. Um, they might become rather puritanical about life and in particular might want to deny the life, say, of the body and perhaps its erotic desires, thinking that that just leads us nowhere, if not being rather revolting and unpleasant, um, and so live a kind of rather strict life. Um, they reject that, and they think that that's trying to deny something about life rather than really taking you more into life. They consider how people try strategies of becoming famous. Um, you know, they might try and um, become really well known in this life, which gives them a kind of um, uh, expansion of their own life, you might say, and maybe even the hope of a kind of timelessness because they'll be remembered after their death. Um, but it seems a poor kind of 
um, deathlessness just to be remembered by others. They consider also those who try to cult cultivate virtues, um, try to be known for what's good, for what's most true. And in some ways this is closest to Socrates himself. Some of his followers would say that he is um, the most honourable, the most admirable person that they know. And yet here he is in prison. He's about to die. Um, and so they conclude that maybe our embodied life is in fact a prison for our soulful life. That because our bodies come to an end, so it will bring to an end as well any kind of inner vitality we have, any soulfulness, any hope, aspiration, nobility, um, sense of what's beautiful and good. Um, this is a very powerful argument. It was then, and it is even more so now, of course. And it leads to the first sort of hiatus um, in the dialogue. Um, but it's an important moment, these hiatuses. It's the first of the real horizons that they feel they've reached and can't maybe see beyond. But they get a hint that maybe there is more of a beyond, partly because, of course, Socrates himself is facing death. Um, he is, in fact, also in a prison. And yet he's also telling them that he has the sense deep inside himself that this prison, this embodied life, actually is not the end. Rather, it's a kind of gateway to a wider perception of life that he's anticipating he's going to experience after he's drunk the hemlock. So maybe they've not understood the body are right. Maybe it's not the end. Maybe it's like a pathway, this life, this embodied life to a wider life. So how might they understand that? Well, Socrates then suggests they think about this life in a slightly different way. They, as it were, lower themselves down a little bit more and see whether they can see a bit more of the inner music of this life. And the way he does that with them is by getting them to think about the cycles of this life. You know, how, for example, hot and cold seem associated with each other how plants grow out of the ground and then die um, to be recycled and grow again. They consider a whole range, in fact, of cycles and patterns um, that are actually surround us. They're there all the time and conclude that it seems that in this embodied life, something does not come out of nothing. Um, there was always uh, an earlier state that might have died away, but to give birth to the subsequent state. And this makes quite a lot of rational sense too, and because it doesn't make sense too that something might come out of nothing, um, because nothing really is nothing. Um, there's not even the potential for something in strict nothing. And so maybe that's true of us as well, um, that our life, though it feels like it has a beginning and a middle and an end, must have come from somewhere. And if it's come from somewhere, then maybe it's going somewhere as well in order that it can be recycled. They think there's some mileage in this, but then they realise that perhaps what is ours in this life, what we've embodied in this life, what we've carried and developed in this life, may be given up and passed on to others when we die, and so therefore also have been received from others when we were born. Um, it's a kind of inheritance notion of life and death, you know, much as we receive a lot because of our biological inheritance going back through our parents and ultimately through all the animal kingdom. Um, but we couldn't claim that that's the continuation of our life in any way. So too, what happens when we die is that we give up all that we have. Um, it goes into the gene pool, you might say, the collective unconscious, um, but has nothing to do with us anymore. Um, we still genuinely die. The soul, used in this old sense of our, vital, our, vital, our vitality, still disintegrates. It's another hiatus, another pause in the argument, another moment where they seem like they've reached a horizon and can't see more. But then Socrates suggests, well, maybe we can see a little bit more. Maybe there is something that's more subtle yet to perceive about these cycles. 
And what he asks them to start to perceive um, is that perhaps there's a kind of timelessness in life, even a kind of divine quality in life. So for example, you know, we human beings, we live in time, we're very aware of the clock ticking, but every so often we also have perceptions of what is timeless. Um, there's an intermediate state that's sometimes called the state of flow, where we don't no notice the passage of time. But every so often we even can feel like we step out of time itself when we're captured by the awe of something beautiful. Um, beauty too, you might say, can give us those kind of uh, a sense that there's something beyond um, just the transitory nature of things that we appreciate. You, know, you can see something that's beautiful, like say a spring flower, um, but it also feels like that flower is a symbol of beauty itself. Um, it's not just a lovely thing to contemplate in the moment, but seems to be channeling far more than itself, something that's beautiful in the world as a whole. And that's partly why it is so beautiful, why it captures us in the moment and gives us a sense of something timeless. Socrates is opening their perception at this point to the part of us that isn't just soulful, but that might even be divine. And he argues that if we can perceive these timeless things, these divine things, these things which seem like what's good, beautiful and true in itself, then that can only be because we share something of these divine qualities themselves. Um, there must be something divine, something timeless, something eternal in us, something not subject to the transitoriness, even of things that are good, as they previously concluded. For a moment or two, it seems that they might have reached the end of their journey. They might have heard the inner music and be perceiving things in the right way. They might, to quote William Blake's well-known phrase, have contemplated a world in a grain of sand, heaven in a flower, held infinity in the palm of their hand and perceived eternity in an hour. But then they realised that even that might leave them at death because if they, as individuals, depart at death, then what's to say that their perception of all these good things isn't going to depart as well? And even if they're sharing in the divine things, then maybe that will disintegrate and come to an end too. It's actually really quite a devastating moment in the dialogue, because you remember, Socrates is going to die. They've now spent about two-thirds of their time seemingly lowering themselves in the well, gathering um, deeper perceptions, more subtle sense of things as they've gone into this labyrinth. Felt like it was all coming together and now it feels like it's fallen apart just once again and in a way in a more devastating way because they thought they got more nuanced perception of things. There's a break in the discussion when Socrates pauses, um, he sort of regroups um, it's said that he um, turns to Fido and uh, tussles Fido's hair, actually, in a rather beautiful, tender moment. And they resort to some kindliness to kind of regroup. But then Socrates realises something else. He says, look, maybe it's not our arguments that we need to really think about. Um, whether they stack up, whether they take us anywhere. It's not our perceptions that we need to try and develop. It's rather something else. It's that we keep on talking about this. It's that we keep striving for these deeper perceptions. It's a bit like saying you don't have to agree what beautiful is, what beauty is, in order to keep talking about what's beautiful, what beauty is. Maybe it always lies slightly beyond your grasp, slightly beyond your perception. But the really devastating thing would be is if people just stopped talking about it at all, then you really would be living in an ugly world. And so too, maybe what's important is not just that we try to contemplate, we try to see and we try to love that which is eternal and deathless in life. But because we do keep talking about these things, Maybe what we've also got to learn is that our talk can never possess them. What it can do, though, is open us to their presence and receive their presence into us, 
rather than trying to hold a sense of these things within us. So in other words, it's not that we possess our souls, but that soulful life holds and contains us. This, in a way, takes them right back to the beginning of the conversation, and for us as readers, right back to the beginning of the dialogue, when there'd been this remark, you yourself, Fido, the signalling that we were going to have to turn inside ourselves, but also give up something of ourselves, because um, the remark is, you yourself, Fido, were you there when Socrates drank from the cup? And it's the perception, I think, that's in, again, many wisdom traditions, maybe all, that um, the way towards deathlessness is actually through death. It's not to try to see around death, to see under death, to see over death, but is to go into death itself. Because when we give up what's sometimes called the small self, um, when in the Christian tradition they talk about dying to self, um, when in the Buddhist tradition they talk about discovering no self, um, when in other Indian philosophies they talk about sacrificing oneself to the to um, the greater good, to Krishna. Um, that is the sense that we don't actually possess our own lives, we don't hold our, our lives, but we're held by a wider life, whether it be the great potential um, capacity of no self, whether it be um, the perception of a divinity that somehow is the source of all life and holds our life. That, perhaps, is what moving towards death, leaning into death, can give us a sense of, because we give up everything that we felt we possessed, that we'd seen, we grasped, we held on to, and realise that, to use a biblical expression, underneath are the everlasting arms. The dialogue continues by Socrates saying, look, let me tell you something about my own development because I think it can illuminate how we can continue from this point. And he says that when he began early in life, thinking about life um, and all these things, he was very enamoured with these, the philosophers of the previous generation that we now call the pre-Socratics. And they were engaged in a kind of new physics. They thought that you could describe the world as a seamless chain of cause and effect that then would explain how we get to be where we are and do what we do, how the stars and the planets work, how the weather um, and civic society works. Um, it feels quite familiar, it's broadly a materialist perception of things. But Socrates said that he realised that doesn't work, and he uses actually where he is right now, sat in the prison, to show why. Because he says if you are a strict materialist, then you would say, the reason why I, Socrates, am sat in prison is because my bones moved in a certain way, my sinews moved in a certain way, my heart and lungs enabled my body to work in a certain way. A purely mechanical description. But that would immediately seem to be utterly inadequate. That is not why Socrates is sat in prison. You might say it's only a part cause, but not the whole cause. There's obviously other causes, so for example, he's been condemned by the Athenian judicial system. So there are kind of causes which you might call causes of justice or morality. And then there's even causes which are to do with what's good and true, because the reason why Socrates actually is drinking the hemlock on this day, when in fact he could have escaped, um, is because he feels it's important to stick to what you believe to be good and true. So the real reason why he sat there it's nothing to do with this mechanistic chain of cause and effect. The deepest reason is because he believes in what is good and true. He wants to die for what he feels is right. But this dying for what is right isn't to try to make Socrates into a philosophical hero. That would be to return to older arguments that they'd had, that where eternity or deathlessness is sought, um, because you embodied certain wonderful virtues or because you had a kind of fame. No, Socrates is realising he can't possess anything, and that's precisely why he can hope for eternity, because by dying to himself in the little ways he has in life, and now, finally, by actually dying, he will be stepping into that which has held him 
rather than he has managed to possess that which is good, beautiful and true. It's going to be precisely opening up onto that which sustains all life anyway, that which is the ground of his soul and not just his own soulful vitality. He says, then I will know most profoundly what I participate in. It will be with the good gods, with good people, with all that's good. It will be to discover me myself, again returning to that opening phrase, you yourself, to realise that precisely because you don't possess life, life possesses you, that's how you can hope for eternity. That's how you can hope for life beyond this little life, through death. Precisely that's the way to go. He talks about how this life of becoming, which we know so much about by the ups and downs of every day, by the very fear we have of death, must rest on a life that is pure being. And it's that pure being which is the basic thing out of which life and all its patterns and cycles springs. And he says that being can't have any death about it because otherwise it wouldn't be being. It's the sort of reverse of the perception that something can't come out of nothing. So too, being can't have anything of non-being within it. At this point, Socrates, with his proximity to death, rests. He rests content. He says he thinks that he said all he can say. There is a sense of his friends around about him that they hope that it's right, they hope that's true. And I think this is conveying to us that in a way it's precisely because of Socrates' proximity to death that he can see most clearly. Um, most of life now has fallen away from him. He knows that he can't possess anything anymore. There's something about the gift of death that does that, that it enables us to see more than itself even as it comes, more, um, comes nearer. We can contemplate that when we think about death and hope that that sense instills more profoundly in us. But it's very easy to get distracted by concerns of the everyday. And in fact, this is what happens in the dialogue. Um, one of his friends um, pipes up and says, look, I know that you're going to die, but what do you want us to do about your funeral? What do you want us to do about your possessions, about your family? And Socrates chuckles and says, I know that's the way you have Crito. Um, this friend's name, um, and he kind of just lets Crito get on with that. He knows that he can't change um, that particular friend in this moment. But what he does say then to the other people assembled is, look, you've got to keep working at this yourself. I'm at this particular juncture. I've got this gift. I'm about to step into eternity. I can see that. Maybe you can't see that completely now. So be inspired by watching me die by working at these things for yourself, this deeper perception. Go into the labyrinth, lower yourself down into the well. Come to the hiatuses, come to the limits of what you can see and stand at that horizon in order that then more might show itself to you. And as long as more does keep showing itself to you, that is the sense that being itself underpins all things. That is the sense that the good, the beautiful and the true holds you in life. It's not that you can possess it. He also advises that they tell each other stories, tell each other myths that can help with developing these perceptions too. And in fact, before Socrates actually dies, the last bit of the dialogue concerns a myth about life after death. Um, this is something which, which Plato had developed elsewhere, most famously in the Republic. Um, he argues there that, that we human beings can never finally know how to live well, um, partly because we live in this world of becoming uh, where things are constantly coming at us um, and so we can never anticipate what might happen next. We constantly need to improvise life. Um, uncertainty surrounds us in that way but also because we do live in a world where we've partly forgotten about eternal things uh, for reasons that perhaps we don't understand. We're given this life um, where we forget 
about um, the good, the beautiful and the true in its fullness, fullest extent. We forget about divine life um, most directly. It seems to be about, um, it's, that seems to be something which we're required to do in this life, perhaps in order that we can develop um, ourselves more, more richly. So he says myths, um, what he called noble lies, um, which in a way we know aren't quite right, but nonetheless are true because they keep us pointing in the right direction. Um, they can help us as well. And so he tells a story about what happens when the soul dies. Um, he says that when you die, um, what you see next is going to be very much shaped by what you have developed the capacity to see in this life. If you can see what's good, beautiful and true in this life, then you'll be able to go to the places in the next life that have got more goodness, beauty and truthfulness in them. There's going to be something true about that myth, something helpful, helpful for us in this life. Um, I think it's why many wisdom traditions also tell similar stories about how what we do now is going to matter in eternity. I think it's to do with what we're capable of perceiving. I'm actually doing a series of YouTubes and podcasts on Dante's Divine Comedy, and it's one of the deep things that gradually em emerges as Dante goes through that odyssey. That's the kind of Christian version of this myth that Socrates is telling. But now they come to the moment of Socrates' death, the moment where for Socrates it all comes to fruition and for his friends and family around him they're left to work out how they're going to proceed, how they're going to carry forward. Phaedo himself tells his friend that he witnessed the death of the most just and honourable man he ever knew. That's how it inspired him to retell this story which has been Plato's dialogue. And so to come back to where I started with the coronavirus and this perception that it's brought death a little bit closer to us and maybe that's an opportunity. This is Plato's invitation to lean into an awareness of death and discover that it actually is the pathway to a wider perception of life. You know, there will be moments where fear and worry dominate and feel even overwhelming. There will also be moments where we're acting out of another side of what it is to be human, which is to reach out to others, to show compassion and kindness to those around us and even to ourselves. But there's this third moment as well, which can open up to us. It's to gain the sense that we can't hold on to what we think we've grasped and understood. We can't possess our own lives precisely because life possesses us. What we see of the good, the beautiful and the true is given to us by what's good, beautiful and true. That our becoming actually rests on a ground of being. And if we can lean into death, that can become death's gift to us, a perception of wider life.